Hello? Okay. Um, thanks for coming. Um, my name's John Lamb, and, uh, and I work for that company over there. Um, at least I do now, and I'm here to kind of tell you a little bit of a story to start off about, um, you know, the kind of whole process for getting um, um, to where I am today. Um, at the last RubyConf in October, I announced that I was coming to Microsoft to, um, to work on dynamic languages, and, and that's still true. Um, but I thought I would give you a few pictures to kind of show you a little bit more about the, the actual process itself. So that's where I used to live in Toronto, right, with a big giant sold sign sitting in front of my house. Um, if you've ever had to move a house with that much crap in it, you'll see that at some point it looks something like that. Right? That's my dog kind of really confused down there about what's going on with all of his stuff. Pardon me? No, that's bubble wrap. No, we didn't take the linoleum. Yeah, we weren't that cheap. Uh, um, we even had to pack our kids in boxes. Um, my wife's pretty happy now. Um, you know, Matthew's doing okay. Um, this is kind of one of these big kind of stressful things. It's where we live now. Um, this is in Seattle. Seattle's a lot prettier than where we used to live in um, in, uh, in Oakville because in, 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 it's kind of flat, not interesting, no trees, kind of typical subdivision um, kind of thing that was out there. This is where I work now. Um, that's the back end of, I think that's Building 43 there with kind of Mount Rainier kind of poking up over the... Uh, um, the hills there. There's actually, that was the, the rare time that snow actually showed up in Seattle, which is, of course, to commemorate my arriving in Seattle. I think this was the second day that we were in, um, um, in Seattle. And this is where I work. Um, so just to kind of, you know, set the stage. Um, the, uh, the thing that I built before coming um, to the firm was uh, a bridge, right? The Ruby CLR bridge. And a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about here are essentially related to the problem that the bridge solved, which is how do I take a dynamic language and um, get it to interoperate with static libraries, right? Because that's sort of the, the first step of the problem, right? Because if you really have to think about it, why would anybody want to run um, Ruby on top of some other guy's virtual machine, right? Be it, you know, JVM or CLR, whatever it is. It's fundamentally to try and get access to the libraries, right, that, that exist on that platform. Um, and this problem is actually a, a rather interesting and rather difficult problem um, because I, I really don't think that sort of like just a plain vanilla solution is going to work, right? So if, let's say that you were writing, I don't know, Python, let's say, right? Um, and that already exists. If you're writing Python and wanted to talk to static libraries, the semantics of how you got to build that interop layer um, between the Python dynamic language and the static libraries is going to be fundamentally different, right, than how you want to do it with Ruby. Um, sure, there's certain elements that are in common. Um, you still got to go off and marshal types around and do con conversions at the, uh, at the interop boundary where appropriate. But you're also going to want to try and do a lot of kind of fit and finish kind of things. And the fit and finish things are really trying to make it so that when you are writing a Ruby program that talks to CLR libraries, that it doesn't feel like you're writing C Sharp with a Ruby syntax, right? Um, and that's an important element of that as well. So, you know, some of the things I'll be showing you in this talk are kind of reflective of the thinking that I've done, um, you know, in that part of um, the equation as well. And actually, what's very interesting at, at, at various points in time, I'm going to compare and contrast some stuff about um, the decisions that the Iron Python team made because. Um, their community is somewhat different culturally, right, than the Ruby community. Um, the, the Ruby community, I find, is a lot more kind of eh, dogmatic, right, about things like how methods are named, right? Like, that's one example of this. Whereas the Python community is perfectly cool with that, right? So one of the things that I'll, I'll show here is, you know, just how, you know, the differences in that kind of led to different design decisions, right, in terms of the interop layer um, between uh, the, the two different technologies. Um, so at this point... I'd like to bring up this slide, right? This is the, the Kathy Sierra thing that I, I absolutely love, right? Which is um, this measure of success in your life, right? Your career, whatever it is that, that you're doing, right? And, you know, um, one of those circles is, you know, what you want to do. Uh, the other circle is what you actually do. And, you know, the, the goal really should be to try and optimize for that thing in the middle, right? That area in the middle and maximize that area, right? Which is, you know... Um, for most people, those two things really aren't quite aligned, right? You know, especially for the folks earlier on in the Ruby, um, you know, uh, history where, you know, those two things, you had this tiny little sliver, which was between the hours of like 8 p.m. and, you know, midnight or 1 or 2 or however late you stayed up. Um, rather than that other thing up at the top, which is to measure it based on how far, 
you know, up some arbitrary ladder that you're, you've climbed. And I feel that, at least for me, you know, coming to Microsoft, it's kind of weird, right? Like, I, I had no idea. This is the first big company I ever worked at. And uh, I managed to successfully never have a full-time job. I, I've only ever had a full-time job for six months in my entire life. And uh, so coming here is a, a rather large, giant culture shock, right? Not just coming to the United States, but, you know, coming to Microsoft, which might as well be another country. And, uh, and also having bosses and bosses' bosses and all that kind of stuff, right, which never really existed in my life prior to that. Um, but what I find, though, is even with all of that overhead um, that, that exists in the company, that I'm spending, like, an awful lot of time doing exactly what I want to do, right? Sure, there's overhead like anything else, right? But I found that, you know, the transition wasn't anywhere near as painful as, you know, I even thought right before going into the company. So I want to spend a bit of time now talking about the, uh, the kind of more interesting technical pieces of this. How many people here right now are writing code on top of um, .NET? I'm just kind of curious. So, so there's like five guys in the room. Okay. Um, how many of you guys are writing on top of JVM um, for some other chunk of stuff? Okay. So some other guys. Um, so what I wanted to do was just to kind of, for most of the people in this room, just kind of show you a really, really quick look at um, virtual machine environments, just so you can kind of understand the kinds of problems and, and get a better feel for what this stuff looks like. And, you know, the best way that I've ever, you know, thought of doing that kind of stuff is to just write you hello world and show you what happens, right? And I'll also show you the little different steps and phases that, that exist in there so you can see, you know, what happens when the compiler compiles in a bytecode or IL in our case and what happens after that, right, when that stuff goes off and gets executed. And I'll also show you, um, I'll show you a static language to start off with and then I'll go off and show you um, a dynamic language after that, right? So you get, you know, a feel for, you know, just how different these things, you know, actually wind up looking like, okay? This thing's still working up there, good. Um, so the best way of doing this is, stay. Um, so let's go off and just write hello.cs, right, as um, a simple C sharp app. Oops. Don't you just hate having to type all this? And this is just for hello world, right? Okay, so that's that's done. So I'm surprised that the human compilers in the crowd didn't catch that. But there's always that one guy in every crowd, right, that will, you know, go off and say, but, but, but that doesn't compile before you actually get to. Hello? All right. So we have hello.exe there. Um, hello.exe does the expected not very interesting thing. But what it becomes much more interesting, at least on the .NET platform, is if you use um, this utility um, called Reflector. And Reflector is a utility that was written by um, a guy that's just kind of like around the corner from me in Building 42. Um, his name is uh, Lutz Roeder. And, uh, sure. Um, and Lutz's program is fascinating, right? Like, so to understand a little bit about Lutz, I, like, I always like telling the Lutz story, which is uh, um, Lutz is a rather young guy. Um, he originally worked on intentional programming with uh, Charles Simone, and intentional programming was this crazy research project that Simone ran for about 15 years at Microsoft, um, which was going to revolutionize and completely change the world of programming. And probably the, the only thing that, that was really memorable in intentional programming was the fact that they had this super editor, right, where you could look at your source code and transform it into different views. Because right, essentially the editor would edit the AST and they would have these various transformation things that would transform the AST into different things, right? So they can show you your program as a, you know, uh, 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 logic diagram, right? So you can see it as a logic diagram, you can see the different languages, you can look at the individual nodes, their source control system was integrated into this, this um, the AST, so you'd actually check in and check out individual nodes inside the AST, right? And that was the granularity at which these things are happened. But anyways, you know, I think I canned eventually, right, by Bill. And then Simone said, fine, I'm a billionaire. I'll go off and fund this myself, and that's essentially what's happening. So if you go out and you look for a company called Intentional Software, that's where all that stuff is. Um, so Lutz wrote this program um, after that because he didn't want to be perceived as being a guy that failed twice at the company, right? Because, you know, this, this thing got, well, he looked at it as failure. Um, so what's interesting about this program is if you look at it and if you minimize this in the taskbar, right, well, if I had slightly higher resolution, you would see it, um, you'll notice that it's not reflector, it's Lutz Rotor's reflector, 
And what Lutz did was he wanted to make sure that everybody at Microsoft knew who he was. Right? And the only way he could do that was to write an application that everybody at Microsoft would have to use right, at some point or another. So this is effectively his business card. And, and, his, and so you're saying, well, you know, what's so interesting about this? Right? This is just you know, a bunch of you know, stuff. Right? It looks like I'm, I'm looking at some namespaces and other things. But this is where it gets really interesting. So we kind of dig into this thing. And that's the app that I just um, typed there. And if we go dig into main, well, it's fine, right? You can imagine, right? We're just kind of reflecting over the metadata, right? That's describing the type. Um, but what's really interesting is if I hit the space bar here, and that's what you wind up seeing, right? So this isn't ripping stuff out of a PDB file or anything else, right? This is walking up to the IL, right? And if you want to look at it as IL, that's what it looks like, right? If you want to look at this as Delphi, because that's what, or Visual Basic, or Delphi, or whatever floats your boat, Right, you can go off and, and look at this. So, so what is this thing? Well, it's a decompiler. Right? It's a decompiler that essentially goes off and reverses any arbitrary chunk of IL. You can walk up to any of the Microsoft system assemblies and, and look at all that. So you can pretty well look at and think about you know, the CLR effectively as being an open source framework right? when you wind up using Reflector right, to go off and look at the implementation. Now, of course, tools like this go off and generate an arms race, right? just like what happens in the Java world, right? where on one side you've got the guys that build the decompilers, on the other side you've got the guys that build the obfuscators, and sometimes it's the same company that builds both things. And, you know, um, so there's, there's you know, a lot of this stuff. You know, people sometimes get really freaked out you know, about this thing, perhaps not deservedly so, but you know, nonetheless people have feelings and sometimes they get hurt. Um, but this is a really interesting tool for kind of exploring things, right? So if you ever wanted to spend a little bit of time on a .NET platform, this is a tool that you should use in your own kind of explorations and spelunking, right? Because this will reveal and show you an awful lot of things, especially when you ratchet it down to this thing, right? So you can see what the actual IL looks like. So the next thing I want to show you here, just so you can get, again, a little bit of a feel for this stuff, is um, an Iron Python app, right? Because this is the only thing I can show you right now, right? Um, so if we were to, you know, do a simple little thing like this, right, and we can go add, well, let's print this. What's interesting is what on earth is this thing going to turn into, right, when we compile it? So let's go off and go and compile this thing, and I can never remember the switches for this thing. Uh, colon generate. What was it? No, save assemblies. So as it goes off, it both you know compiles this thing and runs it. You'll notice that hello.exe is a little bit bigger than if I don't know if you remember the number, right? Than than the C sharp thing. Um, now let's go off and look at this thing on the reflector. Yeah. It's so hard to navigate this one. It's so big. Okay. All right. Um, so now we're into this thing, and you'll notice that whoa, you know, there's all sorts of scary looking things in there. Um, and if we look at that, let's go off and disassemble this. And wow, this font is huge. Okay, let me make this a little bit smaller. Let's bump that down to 18. All right. Um, so what you'll see is that there's a number of interesting little pieces in here. Um, like this is the add method, um, just so that you know. So you see there's an awful lot more stuff here than you might expect, right, um, inside of an add method. Um, so we're essentially reflectively invoking this thing here. Um, and <laughs> there it is. So this is the actual call. So there's a number of helper functions which do things, right? So there's, there's two things I really want to kind of highlight. Um, the add method took x and y as parameters coming into it, right? So you'll notice the first thing is that the type of the parameters is typed as object. Um, in the CLR, um, for uh, optimization purposes, we have value types and we have reference types, right? So things like integers are, are normally value types. These things are passed by value, right? You know, even reference types are passed by value, right? But you're copying the reference, right? Not the, not the, the object. Um, but we pass by value of these value types in, and we can get all sorts of optimizations right, around this thing. Um, but of course, since this is a dynamic language, right, and because integers in Python are also objects, right, we don't really have that luxury. We could do some more kind of fancy things, but that's not being done right now. Um, so effectively, what's going on here is that the integers are being passed in as boxed value types. Right? So there's this notion of boxing and unboxing 
um, on the CLR where we essentially take a value type like an integer and we box it. And the, the act of boxing it is essentially let's allocate an object on the, on the GC heap somewhere and we're going to copy right, this value type into that object. Um, so that's effectively what's happening here. So um, everything is, is operated on as, um, as these, these boxed value types. And of course, we have a variety of little helper functions to do things like add and, and other things. What's clever about the add, unfortunately, it doesn't really kind of show up here because there's a whole bunch of wacky runtime generic stuff that's actually going to happen here, is that um, there are all sorts of different operations where we are going to select and cache the optimal implementation at the call site as well. So there's a lot of interesting work that's being done here to make sure that um, the, the fastest possible thing is happening, right, when you go off and invoke it, right? Clearly, if I were to show you exactly the same program, right, in C-sharp, you'd see there's an add opcode and a bunch of other things, right, which essentially tra translates and maps directly, right, to the x86 instruction. Um, but here there has to be, by necessity, you know, a number of layers in direction, and this is where you see, you know, um, some of the artifacts of the fact that we have this dynamic language kind of coming back out here. Right. So without going into gory, hoary detail about this kind of stuff, I just wanted to give you a bit of a feel for how you know, these things change rather significantly right? when you move into a dynamic language and what it takes to actually go off and implement a dynamic language. Um, there's a number of interesting other little things here which people may or may not have thought about, and one of them is to have a, a, a decent debugging experience. Right? So when you're compiling these things, you need to have a mechanism whereby you know what line is currently executing, right, when you break into the debugger or, or other things like that. Um, so the way this is generally solved, as you'll notice here, is that there is a dollar sign line, um, uh, uh, a local variable allocated inside of this um, stack frame. And in here, we're essentially going to go off and store in location one, right, um, various numbers, right, which are, well, there's only one number there. Um, so we only store in location one um, the, the actual physical line in the source code file. Right, where that method was being executed. So those are some of the little details that you kind of have to start putting into your code when you're compiling into this bytecode format so that you get a decent experience when you go off and you want to debug this stuff inside of the debugger or other things like that. Okay? All right. So that's essentially Hello World. Let's kind of talk a little bit more about specifically Ruby and Ruby interop. Um, and right now I'm going to talk about Ruby CLR because unfortunately that's the only thing I can really talk about right now. Um, so what we're going to think about is, okay, from the real Ruby, right, the C-based Ruby implementation, right, obviously that thing's implemented in C. You can build C extension functions um, or extension libraries, right, um, as well. So if let's think about this, this type called foo. We're going to new it up. We're going to, you know, set some, call a data method and invoke a hello method. Now this thing here, if you were just to go off and build, um, you know, a simple C-based extension for Ruby, um, you would have f, which refers to the instance, you know, um, which has a class member, which refers to foo, which is the class object. The class object has a method table, which at some point in time points to the C-based implementation, right, that sits out in my DLL on the other side, right? So that, that orange line is the boundary between the Ruby interpreter and, um, and, uh, and my extension library. Now, the method, the way you would go off and implement hello on the extension would look something like this. Right, so this is the var arg style um, calling convention that Ruby can go off and invoke the method that would actually handle and do the work um, inside of hello. Now, what if I wanted to implement foo in C sharp? Right, so you know, what would something like that look like? Right, so obviously the the, the on the on the program side of it, it's going to look identical, um, but this is where things start looking interesting. Um, so if we look at this, um, what we have is the uh, on the left hand side. What I, what I generate for you inside of Ruby CLR is a shadow class or a proxy class. And the shadow class looks and feels and smells and tastes just like the real, um, you know, a C Sharp class on the other side, right? And so all operations um, and all method calls always have to be routed through the foo class. So you'll see that in the method table, hello goes off and points to my, my C, or in this case, my C++ CLI code, um, which contains one of these things called a dynamic method. Now, dynamic methods are a really interesting feature of CLR 2.0. Um, a dynamic method is a little chunk of IL. And that little chunk of IL, um, you know, I can go off and generate one of these things. The runtime will then, on the first invocation of that dynamic method, will JIT compile that down to whatever native um, instructions that you want, right? So if you're x86, if you're still running 32-bit windows. Um, and 
So when it compiles down into x86 code, that happens the first time through, and all subsequent times it goes off and, and just calls that, that x86 code. Now, the interesting thing about dynamic methods, however, is the fact that these things, if they are not going to be used anymore, right? So if I remove the reference on that left-hand side, right, that holds that thing and keeps it alive. So there's all sorts of weird little tricks I have to play here, right, on the left-hand side to hold onto a hard reference, right, onto that, that dynamic method, right? And there are other tricks that I have to play with lifetime management on that side to make sure that, you know, um, if that thing went away for some reason, right, that I would go off and whack that, um, that reference, that hard reference to the dynamic method that kept it alive. Now, if that reference goes away, then, of course, the GC can now go off and reclaim the memory that was formerly taken up by the dynamic method. So this is a really important thing, right? Because if you want to go off and JIT stuff and run things in some kind of virtual machine environment, the problem is, is that if you can't either unload the code, right? It's no job you can unload the class, so that's fine over there, right? But in .NET, we can't unload code, right, before dynamic method. So if you've created an assembly, which is like a DLL, if you compiled one of these things, it gets loaded in memory, it stays in memory forever, right? Um, so in a dynamic language, if you're evaling things or generating code or doing whatever kind of wacky things you do, then you have this problem in that if that code, if that memory never gets reclaimed, right, you've effectively got a memory leak here, right? So the, the really nice thing about dynamic methods is it provides us with this mechanism to generate as much code as we want, you know, securing the fact that as long as we didn't, you know, botch our implementation, that the memory will be reclaimed by the GC where appropriate. Now, what that dynamic method does is a whole bunch of magic, right? So the magic inside the dynamic method um, does a bunch of things like, well, here, let me, let, let me give you an example, method overloading. Um, so in C Sharp, it's perfectly legal to allow you to overload functions based on the signature, right, of the function, right? So both based on the parameter signature as well as the return type signature, even though C Sharp doesn't support the return type um, part of it. But the CLR certainly does. Um, Ruby, however, doesn't let you do that at all. So now you have this problem, right? I want to go off and invoke some method, right? And at runtime, I must now do the determination. So I need to go off inside that method stub, inspect the parameters that you're passing in, figure out what types they are, coerce them if appropriately I mean, to, to the appropriate .NET types, and then find the best match, right, of the method on the, the, the C-sharp side to go off and invoke, right? And then on the back side of it, I have to marshal out parameters, return values, all that kind of stuff you know, back to the Ruby side appropriately as well, okay? So those are the kinds of bits of things that have to happen inside that dynamic method. Um, on the Ruby side, to generate the, um, the, the, the shadow or proxy class, I use a combination of const and method missing magic, right? So with const missing, I use that default in a new proxy class, right, the first time the const is referenced. And with the method missing stuff, that's when I just in time build Right, those little inner options, right? So I build them on an as-needed basis, right? So you invoke method, like the add method on array list, that's when I go off and, and build this little um, dynamic method on your behalf. So let's kind of look a little bit at the, the various bits of features here. And, you know, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of just step on it and go through um, um, the slides instead of showing you the code run. I'll show you some code run, just so you know this isn't completely, like, made up and stuff. Um, so this is probably the simplest possible example where I'm going to import um, the, uh, the, the array list type into Ruby. So, so I do the right things with uh, namespaces and mapping namespaces back onto modules over in Ruby. So you can do the include system collections, and now I can just go off and array list.new this thing. Um, once I've got that, I can go off and call the add method. The add method will go off, add 42 into that thing, add John and... And I also do the right thing back on the Ruby side by overloading the, you know, the square bracket operator um, so that you can go off and index into this stuff the way you would expect to be able to do this kind of stuff inside of Ruby as well. Okay? So that's a, a simple little example of um, using that. Um, events are really naturally mapped back on the blocks. Right? So this is an example of not just building the dynamic method right, that allows me to go from Ruby to C Sharp right, or to the CLR, um, this is an example of where I have to build a dynamic method that allows me to go from the CLR back into the Ruby side, right? So this is what happens when the CLR object, in this case a button, is going to fire an event and I'm going to handle that event um, inside of a block, right? So you can see here that the syntax, again, is very natural there, right? I've got, you know, okay, button dot click, set that thing up, that's going to map things. So there's a lot of magic that happens inside dot click, 
I have to generate one of these dynamic methods, bind it to the event um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the button object, and wire it back up to this Ruby block on the other side. Right? So that little chunk of code shows you know, simple event handler um, there as well. Interfaces are an interesting beast, right? Because um, we have this thing where in in the in, in the C sharp and, and in CLR, interfaces are first class concept, right, inside of the language. Now the question is, is that well, how do I expose this idea, right, in Ruby, right, which is kind of a wacky thing. So this was my first attempt at getting this, and this is wrong, by the way. Um, so if you take a look at this, there's an array list. I'm going to add something to it. And my first thought, right, for, well, gee, how do I want to handle this is, okay, once I've got A, I'm going to add a method called the as method, right? So this is very similar to the C-sharp syntax where you can use the as operator, right, to cast something right to a different type. Um, so I can say, okay, well, walk up to A, give me the enumerable interface on that. And once I've got that, I'll get enumerator. Once I've got that, I need to cast that, of course, right? Because I need to tell it what type it is back to an I enumerator um, interface reference. Once I've got that thing, then I can go off and invoke the methods like move next. Um, by the way, once you see this kind of stuff, you'll also notice my my little name mangling thing happening as well, right? So what I what I do is I look for the literal name for the method on the other side, right? When I create and set up that method shim for the first time. Um, so obviously in C sharp that would be capital M, capital N, and no underscore, right? For move next. Um, but what I do is if I don't find a name that is that looks like that, then I will also try to mangle the name. Right? This is a simple algorithm. It's not rocket science here, right? And uh, and I'll go off and try and invoke it using the other name as well. And I will build up that method proxy to call it as appropriate. So the nice thing about this is it makes your you know .NET programs feel a lot more like Ruby programs, right? Simply because you don't have this kind of foreign naming convention kind of injected inside of your code. Now back to this thing. Why is that wrong? Like this doesn't really work. This works most of the time, right? Which is like a lot of ideas that you have, right? You go and you pat yourself on the back and go, yeah, that looks nice, that reads nice, it's not bizarre or weird, but it just can't work. The reason why this can't possibly work is that A dot as, right, I enumerable, the thing I return from you is a different object, right? Which is pointing to the same real object on the other side. Does that make sense? Right, because I'll have multiple proxy classes. I'll have, you know, the proxy class for array list, right, the class interface, right, to the object. But I will also have another thing, which is an enumerable um, um, proxy, right, which is a different Ruby object identity, right? So now I've got two Ruby object identities, referring to the same CLR object identity on the other side. I've broken identity right across this boundary. All right, so clearly this can't work, and I need to go off and, and build something. Right? You'll discover fun things when you shove these things in the hash tables and other fun things like that. Um, so we've got, we got to get rid of that code, and we've got to make something that looks like this. This is probably the, even though this looks kind of weird, because this, again, looks like Yoda just walked up to this thing and turned and flipped everything around backwards. right? But um, I effectively now have to take um, I enumerable as a type and kind of treat this thing as sort of like a, you know, a static method, right? So, so get a numerator where I explicitly pass in the instance, right, that I want to go off and invoke it on, right? That's the only way that I can go off and do this without violating identity here, right? So behind the scenes, I can generate the appropriate proxy to make that happen, and everything's fine. I can still shove, you know, um, E into um, a, uh, a hash, and things just work just fine. On the other side, um, here's, here's some other things that I did here. Um, in the array class, right, so this is the array, this is the Ruby array class over on this side. Um, what I also do is I also have it so that it implements the enumerable interface. Right, so the enumerable interface now means that, oh, sorry, no, this is a .NET proxy class, not the Ruby class. Um, so on the .NET proxy class side of the house, I have it so this thing also implements I enumerable. And this allows me to go off and build enumerators for this stuff um, in Ruby. So if I wanted to go off and add this kind of stuff, this is like the boring stuff here, which is you know the, the guts of an implementation of um, um, an enumerator. The performance of this thing is remarkable, really, right? Because if you factor out Ruby loop overhead, right, which is very important here, um, if you factor out Ruby loop overhead um, and you just measure the time spent in the interruptions, I get over 3 million calls a second across that. Now, this is for the trivial case, right? I'm marshalling an integer across the boundary and, you know, getting an integer back, right? There's really not a lot of stuff going on here. 
you know, your mileage is going to vary, for example, if you wanted to take a Ruby string and marshal across the boundary, right? Because if you want to take a Ruby string, which is a mutable string, right, and marshal across the interop boundary to .NET strings, which are immutable strings I have to copy, right? I have to copy going in and I have to copy coming back. Right, so of course your mileage is going to vary on those kinds of scenarios um, in terms of how fast you can get this stuff to go. Um, the reason why it's so fast is because I generate these shims. And this is actually one of the more kind of really interesting parts of um, Ruby CLR is how those interop or those little dynamic method shims are actually generated. These things are all generated by Ruby. And, and so this is one of these kinds of rather extreme examples of, you know, kind of pushing the DSLE kind of things of Ruby to do wacky things, right? You know, so what I do here is I emit and I generate IL code entirely from Ruby, largely due to the fact that it's just easier for me to do that, right? The very first version of this, this bridge, was implemented entirely inside of C++. And inside of the dynamic methods, that's really where a lot of change happened and a lot of experimentation and the rest of that. And just the amount of additional syntax goo that I have to type in C++ to make this happen was really painful. Right? So it's a lot easier for me to do stuff like this inside of Ruby. Um, and the inspiration for this idea actually came from Ward Cunningham when I saw Ward give this talk at Upsal a couple of years ago. And, and Ward gave this really fascinating talk where he was trying to explain to folks how you can do extreme programming in assembly language. Right? Because this was one of these questions that um, he was, he was talk, teaching an XP class at Intel, and, you know, at the end of the week, um, you know, one of the attendees came up to him and said, you know, wow, this stuff is really cool, right? You know, to you guys as a Java programmer, but I write codecs, right, in assembly language for a living. How does this help me? You know, and this question actually bugged Ward for such a long time that, you know, it took him a couple of years until he actually had to go off, and this was all part of this crazy thing that he was showing off at Oopsla, where he was building these robots out of these $1 CPUs, and he wanted to build this development environment to download stuff onto these robots to get it to wave a flag in an aesthetically pleasing fashion, right? And, uh, and out of all of that, he essentially built this emulator, right, for the CPU that he was targeting, right? He built that emulator entirely inside of Java, right? He wrote his code, you know, trying to force Java to do DSLE kind of things, Right? But the interesting thing was then he could go off and refactor all this stuff. Right? He could unit test this stuff. He could do all sorts of really interesting things right? for assembly language. So a lot of these ideas here were kind of borrowed and stolen directly from that. So some of the interesting things I can do is embed opcodes. Right? So there's the load under this opcode. Right? And the load under this opcode is really a macro that goes off and expands back into this thing over on this side. Right? So um, load under self, well, you know, that's the scrape the thing out of the, the Ruby thing, make sure I get the self-reference. Um, but the stuff inside of the if, load C under I4 and RS, that's all IL instructions, right? And then I can do some other stuff to conditionally generate different chunks of code based on, in this case, whether or not it's a value type or a reference type um, that I'm actually um, retrieving here. Right, so you can do a lot of really interesting things inside of the language, including, you know, going off and writing assembly language right inside of Ruby. Um, now, there's all sorts of Ruby helpers inside of here, right? So let's kind of take a look at some of this stuff. Um, so again, when I need to declare an array, I need to declare an array of a specific type, right? So if you think about it, before we had generics in, in .NET 2.0, arrays were sort of like the original generic type, right? I need to declare an array of type, whatever it is, in this case, an int32. Um, so this is how I inject some type information back in the language as well. So I can say, I want an array of int32, new it up, I want four elements in it, stuff those values into that. But then coming back on the other side, this is the kind of stuff I can do, right? Because I mix in enumerable, right? So the, so the marshaller is smart enough so that essentially what it does is it looks to see the, the object that you're marshalling back, right? Does it implement the .NET I enumerable interface? And if yes, then I mix in the enumerable mix in. Right, at the same time and provide an implementation right, um, as well. So the nice thing is then you can go off and walk over it with collect, right? and that's actually a .NET array that you're now using from within Ruby. Right? So it's a lot of these old, this is not hard. right? This is, I don't know, like 10, 15 lines of code or something like that um, in the thing to make this happen. But you know, paying attention to these little details are what really makes this interop layer important. Um, here was something that was actually um, submitted by uh, 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 a contributor, and this is um, this idea where blocks can be used for all sorts of things, as you all know. Um, the only thing that's sort of like a block, right, in C Sharp, is this thing called a using statement. And the using statement was added in such a way to guarantee that an object that implements an iDisposable interface is guaranteed to be cleaned up 
right, when it hits the, when it exits the scope of the using, right? So when we hit the trailing curly in that thing, um, the C-sharp compiler wrote some code. There's a, you know, try catch inside of the block that's being protected, right? There's a finally section sitting in the bottom, right, where we essentially guarantee that the object gets disposed. And one of the problems in C-sharp was the fact that oftentimes you might want to have multiple disposable objects used in some scope, and you'd have to nest the usings. Right? But the nice thing about Ruby, again, is that we can kind of bend the block syntax to do arbitrary things. So this is a case here where I can new up two disposable objects, class A and B, right? And inside of N there, right, inside of my block, I can go off and automatically call the dispose method on that for you. I also have support for generics. Mm, somewhat limited, because generics are just pervasive and everywhere. So I have, I'll, I'll demonstrate the kind of support that I do have, and I'll also talk about the kind of support that I don't have. Um, so these are the kind of simple scenarios for generics, right? I want a container, right? So this is a list of type N32, um, which is a dynamic list of objects. Or it's, a, it's a dynamic array, it's not a dynamic list. Um, so you can see the, the runtime checks in there, right? So the second um, add is obviously gonna fail here. Um, the, um, the, the other stuff about where the generic stuff um, is, is somewhat limited is the fact that if you kind of drink the generics Kool-Aid and you start using this stuff everywhere, you're gonna run into these scenarios where you're gonna have overloads with generic types, you know, which the types aren't expanded until um, runtime, right? And, you know, and trying to select the correct overloaded method by inspecting the types of these, these expanded or concrete generic types is actually a really, really hard problem for you to get correct in all of the corner cases. So what I don't support in Ruby CLR now is allowing you to correctly resolve and find the correct overloaded method Right, if you wind up having generic type parameters right, inside of those methods. That's a limitation. That's, it's not something that just can't be done. It was just a very painful thing to do, and, and there were other things that were more important than that on the list. Um, so there's this other thing here, right, which is you know, I can't implement all features. So I want to provide people with an escape route, right, a little safety valve for them to go off and do some other weird stuff right, in cases where I don't have a feature. So I don't want to block anybody. Um, and so this is one of the interesting um, cases I built here. So I ripped this idea off of the Ruby inline thing from, from Ryan Davis and company. And this is, you know, my, my, my analog here in Ruby CLR where I can inline C-sharp code or VB.net code or whatever wacky .NET language you want to use um, inside of my Ruby program. And this was here, this was a case because at this time I wasn't supporting nullable value types. So if you look at that weird looking bool question mark thing there, in .NET 2.0, we have the ability to have nullable value types, right? So this is really useful when you're talking to databases, right? Because you could have a Boolean coming back from a database which could be true, false, or null, right? And before, there was really no good way for you to represent the null, right, coming back from the database, right? So these nullable value types turned out to be a very useful thing. Didn't support them, so I had to call this API, the show dialog thing, which was a, implemented using these things, so I had to, you know, put in this little hack and shim to make that happen. But you can absolutely do these kinds of things by inlining code. So you can inline some C-sharp code to solve little thorny problems like this, or you could also inline some C-sharp code because, hey, I want stuff to run faster, right? And that's a perfectly reasonable thing for people to have as well. Um, so that's just the example of using that thing. Um, now, this is a, a thorny case. So back to the overloading problem again, right? Um, when I overload, I need to essentially figure out what the types are on the Ruby side of the house, right? And then try and figure out, okay, which is the correct method to call on the other side. But if you look at those two method signatures, that's perfectly legal, right, in C Sharp, right? Because ints and chars are two different types. But guess what, right? There's no int and char type inside of Ruby. So there's absolutely no way that I can tell those two methods apart, right, by inferring, right? I can't resolve the correct um, method here. So what I do there is I come up with a mechanism where um, I build these kinds of shims, right? So the shim here is I'm allowing you to manually say, hey, right, in the case where it was the int32 char case, the name of the shim that, that I want you to build will have that name, right, that, that name in yellow there, right? So I'm allowing you as a programmer to disambiguate um, these cases that I can't figure out for you um, at runtime. Right, so that's a useful feature to have in there as well because, you know, even though this is going to be a weird corner case, right, when you run into one of these things, then you'd have to do that weird C-sharp thing or something else, and that's just not going to feel very good. Right? But these kinds of problems are definitely going to exist no matter what dynamic language you're using um, to go off and talk to um, statically typed libraries that might have this kind of stuff inside of it. 
This also has a nice kind of side effect in the sense that because I'm binding exactly to one method, one of the design points inside of Ruby CLR is that if I know that a method doesn't have any overloads, right, I have this fast call path where I don't try to run my overload resolution algorithm, right, against, you know, the, 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 the type. So I only do the type conversion, I call it straight in. Right, so this has the side effect of actually being faster, right, on the interop boundary, right, because I don't have to attempt to do overload resolution inside of the shim that I generate for you there. Ah, this. So, um, there's this technology, right, from Microsoft. And I like making fun of these guys because it's just, it's almost too easy, right? Um, so, like a lot of companies, there's this kind of fixation on XML, right, this kind of weird, kind of a natural fixation. And, and XML is great for a lot of things, um, but it's certainly not great for people to edit, right, if human beings need to edit this stuff. Um, now, in the defense of the guys that created this technology, right, which is the XAML stuff, right, XAML is um, a new presentation. Um, well, XAML hasn't got anything. It's just a markup technology, right? XAML is a way to describe a tree of objects, right? Just think about it that way, right? And to, you know, set properties and do a bunch of other things with this thing. That's really what XAML is. Now, there are different technologies that layer on top of XAML, like Windows Presentation Foundation, right? So what's happening here is this is an example of WPF expressed as XAML, right? Um, where some tool is going to spit this thing out, right? So XAML itself as a file format was fundamentally designed for tooling, right? Because in trivial little cases like this, I'm in the menu, a bunch of other things, yeah, sure, you guys could do this stuff, right? I can do this kind of stuff, right? But if you ever see some of these crazy, wacky things that you can do in Flash, for example, right, with animations and gradient fills and nice vector line drawings and meshes on 3D surfaces, you're not going to type that stuff in by hand, right? Nobody is. Right, you know, so you're going to use some kind of designer tool for that stuff anyways, and that was really the primary scenario for this. But I still feel that there are going to be cases where I'm going to want to go off and build small applications, right, in XAML, right, like this. So what can I do to make that a little bit better? Well, this is a case where I could have that other file, right? As an external file, I can load it in and do a bunch of little things here, right, to make it happen. Um, I'm going to load... WPF.load will go off. That's a little helper method I wrote, which will take that editor.xaml and return me the object, right, that the XAML um, parser instantiated on my behalf. I can call find name on that, find something, click it, print something. You know, you get the idea about what this thing does. Um, I can make it suck a little bit less by doing this, right? So I could take find name and turn it back into the square bracket operator. Right? One of the nice things about this is that in a static... Remember, remember about these proxy classes, right, that I create. I can effectively write something that looks like this. I can now shove this thing into framework element, which is the, exactly the right place, right, to put this thing in there. And all other Ruby applications that call into that API, right, from the Ruby side of the house are now going to be able to use this, right, which is a nice thing to have, right? This is something you're used to, but you're not used to doing this kind of stuff calling a static library, right? And that's the part that's really interesting. I think that there's a very interesting space um, for folks that really like designing APIs, Right, to go off and take some sucky API, right, on, you know, the static library side and build a really nice usable wrapper, right, um, to go off and use that stuff on the other side. Right, so I think there's a lot of little design things that can be done like this um, to make things better. We can even take it a little bit more further than that. So that's essentially taking the original XAML thing, using some of the wackier Ruby metaprogramming stuff here, right, to go off and allow me to define um, the element tree or the object tree that I previously defined inside of XML, but entirely inside of Ruby. And the interesting thing about this is, and I don't have an event handler in this case, but the event handler gets scoped appropriately based on Ruby lexical scoping rules, which is actually really important, because XAML has wacky lexical scoping rules, right, which are not what you would expect, right? You know, so this stuff actually makes things significantly easier if you are building these kinds of relatively simple applications, right, where you're not doing all the crazy 3D stuff and the gradient fills and the rest. Ah, so let me show you, you know, some other code running. Um, the really kind of fun thing I want to show you here is this thing that I hacked up uh, on a dare. Hold on, hold on a second. And... <laughs> Oh, I hate that thing too. Okay, gotta fix that. Um, 
There we go. So if you're going to go off and build software um, on dynamic languages, right, one of the real valuable things, at least for me, is ERG, right? This idea that I write a line of code, I execute a line of code, I write another line of code, and execute another line of code. Um, and, you know, what if we can, let's, you know, we have all this hardware on these boxes, right, which are a lot better than, you know, console things, right? You know, so why can't we try and use the technology, right, to provide a better interface, right, to, for doing console -y types of things? And as you can imagine, I'm a big fan of black, and I really like, you know, this kind of minimalist thing. And so we can go off and do things like, you know, write some uh, uh, kind of a better herb. So this was a first stab at writing a better herb that I did a while ago. So I can go off and run this thing. I can colorize this thing inside there. I can invoke this thing over here. I can, you know, get some IntelliSense showing up there, you know. Right, that can go off and run. Um, this, this, this is all of this Windows Presentation Foundation stuff up here um, that, I'm, that, that this thing is built using. So I can even go off and put in, you know, some really nice formatting. Right as well. So this is um, something that I stole from um, the, the, the the Ruby cookbook, right? And uh, so I just typed this thing in and formatted it a nice way, so you can get an idea of what, you know, it'd be really kind of cool if I can now take help, right, from some other system or from a book like this and integrate this directly into your Ruby experience, so I don't have to all tab into some. This is almost sort of like the Emacs school of thought, right? Coming back in here, right? Um, where I can bring the thing into my one true shell, right? So I can now look at it inside of there. And the nice thing about this is, unfortunately, because I had to do this wacky resizing thing, this thing is sized for a much different window size. Um, I can't show you the really cool stuff, but I could, like, you know, zoom in and out on this, do this document and do a bunch of other things, right, which are really pretty interesting as well. Um, I have some other thing here where I can just kind of show some um, documentation. And this documentation I actually... Um, extracted, all of the documentation for all of the types in the .NET framework are available via web service um, on MSDN. So this was a case where I just kind of manually massaged and did some transformation against this, but you can imagine writing some code to do this, where you can say, give me the docs for file, give me the docs for array list, and this stuff would just be sucked in over a web service and dropped into your little interactive console thing in here as well. Right, so this thing is all written using Ruby CLR and Ruby. This is about 300 and some odd lines of Ruby code. Um, to make this thing happen, right? You know, but this is kind of at least a proof to show that, you know, you can actually do some things, right, using um, this interop layer in the shims and, and the other things that we have in here. Okay, cool. So, what is that? Um, now, the... So, the problem really is, is that you know, if any of you guys were here um, at RubyConf before, um, you'll realize that, you know, this is more or less the same talk, right? And I apologize, right, for that. In fact, in the last six months that, you know, in my defense, essentially, I was involved in a really insanely complicated move that sucked up every waking moment that I had. Um, and, but once that's done, now that's over, right? There, there's stuff happening now, but unfortunately, I can't say anything. But, you know, the good news about the, the stuff is I am actually working on stuff that you would think I would be working on. And um, and uh, if you keep your eyes open on April 30th, right, there's a conference that Microsoft runs called the Mix Conference. And at the Mix Conference, you will see what I've been working on since I joined the company and a whole bunch of other really interesting things, right? The whole other interesting things, by the way, right, when, um, when I accepted the offer, you know, to go to Microsoft, it wasn't until all that other stuff that you really have no idea about right now, right, that's actually the much more interesting piece right around this. And dynamic languages, I think, play a very important role in that other really interesting thing, right? So April 30th, don't bother going to Vegas, right? You, know, it's, I, you don't need to do that, right? But just, you know, keep an eye out on the internet, and you'll, you'll find the announcements coming out of there. Um, if you really are interested in this stuff, the conference to go to is PDC, which happens in October, right? Because, like, a lot of things, where right, you tend to announce things before you have, like, you know, the great bits ready, right? By PDC, I'm reasonably confident we will have pretty great bits ready, right, for things for you to actually play with. Right, so if you actually wanted to play this stuff, that's a really good time to go, um, you know, invest the time if you have the time to do that. Okay? I think that's it. If you guys have any questions about this thing, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions that I can. So the question is, um, you only have a PowerPC system. Um, you don't have parallels. You can't run parallels. 
Therefore, you can't really run Windows in a way that doesn't really horribly suck, right? Because virtual PC is just a horrible way of going, right? Because it's really, really slow. Um, and uh, so what can you do? Could you run this stuff on top of Mono? So there's fundamentally nothing about anything that we're building, right, that would preclude running on Mono, right? Like, as far as I know, there's really no APIs that we use that they haven't, you know, implemented on the Mono side. Um, but on the flip side is we're really not actively doing anything there, but this is one of these great things for the community to pick up, right? If, so this is exactly what happened with the Iron Python project, right? So on the Iron Python project, there's a source forge project called FePy, right? Iron Python, F-E-P-Y, right? And uh, so the FePy project um, essentially tracks the Iron Python releases on Windows and, and essentially does whatever wacky things they need to do in order to guarantee that it works on top of Mono, right? So, um, so definitely there is, is one data point, right? You know, that's already happened in the R and Python community, right? So. Question is, can you call Ruby CLR using Mono? Not today. And, and I actually spent some time with Miguel trying to figure out why. And he blames it on the C++ compiler, right? So um, the, the thing about Mono, right, is they don't have a C++ compiler, right? Um, so they only have a C Sharp compiler. And, and apparently, right, this is you know, words out of Miguel, right? is the fact that the, the, the Microsoft C++ compiler injects a whole bunch of wacky attributes into the managed assembly that is runtime.dll in, in the thing that I built. Um, and those attributes aren't supported by Mono. But what Miguel thinks is that all it would really take is for some guy to write, you know, Perl script to walk over. So what you could do is disassemble it into IL, right, using IL DASM, right, and, and run a, a Perl script over this thing to rip out all the attributes that, that, that Mono doesn't support and then feed it back through ILASM, right? You should be able to make that work, right? Or Ruby script, sure, yeah. <laughs> Some regular expression-y thing, right? Yes? Yeah, it's, in, it's, up on, it's up on Ruby Forge now, right? It's been up there for a while, yeah. There's a whole bunch of wacky dependencies on it, which are kind of semi-documented, right? But, you know, um, but I, I got it to work on a pretty, you know, vanilla installation here, so. Okay, cool. Thanks again.